This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. In the last year, a number of colleges and universities have reported serious declines in their enrollment and financial crises. Departments and majors have been cut, staff have been laid off, and there's even been a movement at certain colleges to end the system of tenure. Meanwhile, the total national debt for college graduates is over $1.3 trillion. And as we know, there is no real intellectual debate on college campuses. We know that more than 90% of humanities and social science professors agree on the fundamental questions in politics. But while all this is happening, another thing has been happening. Millions of people are listening to podcasts like this. They're watching YouTube videos. They're doing their own research online. They're talking to each other in various digital forums. And they're also attending brand new universities like Renegade University to meet in person, to talk in person, to debate in person with each other. And that's what happened a few weeks ago in New Orleans at the Renegade University weekend co-hosted with the School Sucks Project. We had a socialist feminist professor from Harvard at one point debating a libertarian plumber from Louisiana. We had a real competition of ideas this last weekend, but it always remained civil. It always remained fun. And I know that it made everyone think a lot harder about the ideas they brought there. We end every one of these weekends with a special live podcast recording in which the weekend attendees are the guests on the show. These are my interviews with Jason, Norm, Joel, and Britt. We'll wait for Thad to finish his donut. You can't eat a donut on a podcast. Yeah, I can. Yeah, and you remember the mic? Isn't this my podcast too? All right, so yeah, you eat donuts on your show. Hey, Thad. Hey, Brett. And hey, this everybody. Donut is fantastic. Thanks for attending Renegade University to present a weekend with Thaddeus Russell, encounter number three. <laughs> what did Jeb Bush say? Please clap. <laughs> I was a said, half a second away from saying please it. Please like me. I have to say this was my favorite of the three we've done so really? far. Sorry, L.A. and sorry, Salem, but this is the best place I've ever been in my life. Why did you like it so much? I think this is just one of the coolest, most interesting cities I've ever been to to start oh. with. I thought we had a great group. I liked the topics. I liked the variety. I liked that Camille Foster was here. We learned a lot from the first two that we did, and we made this one the best, and I look forward to that continuing. I love them all equally, which means yeah. that this was awesome. It Indeed. really was, in a lot of ways, which we'll talk about now, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We're going to start bringing some people up to uh, get on the mic and ask questions. But I want to start over here, and we'll work our way across. I'm going to ask for hands a couple of times along the way, if that's okay. Jason? All right, so um, I'm going to go a, a different direction from what we discussed today or over the weekend. Uh, but um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, foreign policy and the military and things like this, um, and uh, also um, psychological and physical distance and how that aids in military operations and, you know, the the willingness of the public. So we, we discuss um, this weekend, uh, we discuss the state and the state's nature, regardless of how you feel about the state and its usefulness. 
I think we can all agree that the military and military actions are one of the most impactful manifestations of the state. I, I don't think this is controversial. Okay, so uh, I, I was um, talking to Brett and some of the other people when we had a uh, earlier this morning talking about a, a anecdote of a uh, American bomber pilot during World War II who was, you know, above Hamburg or Dresden or somewhere as the bombs are going off. So he had, he was up in the sky. He had physical distance from what the actual consequences were on the ground. He was uh, shot down and actually ended up going through the rubble. And then it hit him. He realized he saw the manifestation of, of what, what he was doing. So the way I look at it, we have this whole mechanism going on. We have, uh, politicians, we have generals, we have soldiers, drone operators, there's all this distance, psychological as well as physical, right? They, they sort of work hand in hand. So I, I just don't know. Uh, I have anxiety because um, I know you talk about this a lot, Thad. We have Russia, we have Syria, we have Saudi Arabia. We have all these actors. And you've said, you've tweeted before that, you know, it's kind of not in an alarmist way, but just making observations. Everything's lining up for World War III. And it's, people always say that would, that would never happen. Well, people said that in the past. So I look at us here this weekend and where, you know, I see all this diversity and beauty and empathy and dynamism. And uh, I just worry that we could throw that all away with just, um, you know, caught up in a machine, a mechanism that is so strong. And once it starts, we'll just be caught up. When I say the machine, I sound like that guy at Berkeley. I forget his name. The machine. Mario Savio. Mario Savio. I, throw your bodies upon the machine. Yeah, I, I don't mean it in that way. Uh, to I, make it stop. Or to make said. it stop, Yeah. I would want to make it stop in some other way. But I, I just want to know if, uh, if you can touch on what I've said and outside of just, you know, listening to Scott Horton all day, you know, what else, what can we do as, uh, as, as empathetic, concerned people to, to bring light, to close that distance you remember famously during George W. Bush's term, we couldn't see the coffins, right? We, we, no, no, you can't see the consequences of the actions. You have to be separated from it. So just wondering in, in the context of what we're doing here and everything, uh, what can we do? Um, exactly what we're doing right now. It's the only thing we can do, I think. I mean, well, there's other things we could do. We can go out and make sure the right person gets elected president next time. I don't think that's going to matter much in terms of whether we annihilate everyone on the globe. Uh, it might, but certainly I believe in the, the, the theory of social change. I'm a Hegelian. Hegel versus Marx, this big debate right, that they had, Hegel basically said, history is determined by ideas, and Marx said, History is determined by material conditions. And that's a big fight between what's called the idealists and the materialists. And it's an interesting fight. And I used to be a materialist. And now it makes no sense at all to me. And I'm completely a Hegelian idealist. I think history is determined by ideas. I can't explain why particular people have particular ideas at particular times. But I am pretty much convinced that that's what does change the course of history. So what do we do? Voting is not actually production of ideas. There's nothing intellectual about it necessarily. What we can do is talk and think on our own and do exactly this. Now, it would be nice if there were 5 million people here instead of 30 people here, but, but this is how all the things started. Look, we talked about the Founding Fathers a lot, you know, and I have all sorts of criticisms, but this is what they did, actually. They met in little taverns in Boston and Philadelphia and New York sometimes five, sometimes 10. They didn't even have the internet then. Yes, they were wealthy people and they had resources, but it really was a movement of talk and ideas. I didn't like a lot of their ideas, but that's how they changed history, right? Yes. If they didn't have those ideas, I don't think we would have America the way it is now. We wouldn't have had an American revolution. It all starts that way. So I know it sucks. You want to see, believe me, I want to see all the nukes dismantled immediately. Yeah. And I want to see the U.S. military bases across the globe closed down. 
et cetera, et cetera. But I don't see a faster way of doing it than by simply talking to each other in places like podcasts or even better in person. But that's it. We're doing it. It's happening all over the place. This is not the only podcast. This is not the only organization or institution or movement that's doing this. There are a lot of people doing this. And when they cohere, and here's a good example. I actually think, and I sort of said that this, this this weekend, that the reason we have legal cannabis in this country is largely because of Joe Rogan's podcast and other podcasts like it, which represent millions, millions of Americans who, it doesn't even matter if they vote, became almost a consensus within American culture about on this question. I think that really moved the needle. It changed people's minds. When you change the culture, law will follow. I've said this many times. I believe law is downstream from culture. Right. And so, you know, Joe Rogan for years was talking about how ridicul ridiculous it was to have laws against marijuana as he was smoking his blunt while he's talking to the public, right? Yeah. And that, I think, had a huge effect on people. I really do. And then it had a ripple effect. You know, other people started to talk this way. Other people felt um, entitled to do that kind of thing and to speak that way. I think the fact that Joe was and is literally high many times on his podcast, I think actually helped big time move the needle on this question. It's one of the major reasons, I'm not kidding, why I think we have legal cannabis in many states. It became normal and okay. As if you were drinking, it's fine to drink whiskey when you're podcasting or doing a radio show, but now it's okay, or it became okay, largely because of him and people like him simply doing it, to smoke weed. And I just want to add, it, it seems culturally like psychedelics is moving in that direction. Yeah, but let me might just, not have the same speed. But let yeah. me just finish with foreign policy, because you raise, you know, foreign policy war is a way harder thing. Yeah. Because as you're saying, Americans in particular are especially distanced from it and have been historically for some obvious reasons, two obvious reasons being the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, right, which separate us from much of the rest of the world where most of the wars have happened. And because Americans, for whatever reason, and there's a long debate about this, are, and actually Heidi and I were talking about this earlier, are uh, Americans have been noted for many things. One of them, which I don't talk about much, is their anti-intellectualism. So they just tend to be, for whatever reason, less curious about the world, except the handful of people who actually determine foreign policy who are really curious about the world, which we've talked about a lot. But Americans generally don't have any idea where Syria is on a map, much less the internal politics of Syria, much less whether or not it is justified or beneficial to invade Syria or bomb Syria or remove the dictator. They don't even know who the vice president of the United States is much of the time, right? They can't identify Washington, D.C. Forget Aleppo. They can't identify Washington, D.C. on a map. So I don't know what else to do because the schools clearly are not working in informing these people. I don't know what else to do but to continue to talk about places like Aleppo and things like war and drones and the history of these things and suggest that maybe it's not a good idea to have submarines that can wipe out every single living thing on Earth and have 20 of those submarines patrolling the oceans all the time. People don't even know that is a thing. They don't even know that exists, right? Don't, do you think Americans walk around thinking about how many nuclear missiles are on each submarine in the U.S. arsenal? No, they're not even aware of it. So we just have to talk and get hopefully bigger and bigger platforms and bigger audiences, just like Joe Rogan did. I really think with cannabis, we can do it with foreign policy and war. On the world scale, too, I think that this disconnection makes dehumanization so much easier as well. Like, everyone's seen the pictures of, like, propaganda posters for World War II where the Japanese are drawn to look like rats, right? When, I mean, and we see this happening nationally, and there's so many people, it's, only come, it's become cliche at this point, like, people who don't talk are going to fight. Right. So the United States is in this unique, uh, unique sort of geographical situation where obviously we wouldn't be as interested in foreign policy as people in Eastern Europe or, you know, maybe in some more educated parts of the Middle East. It's like we're in a bubble. You don't have to think about these things. But because of that disconnection, and this was true all throughout the 20th century, and it's been true after 9-11, disconnection makes it easy to do dehumanization. It, it happens in popular culture. It happens in political speeches. And I think that calling that out or at least challenging people on that when it happens, because people just go to that so quickly, right? It's like it's an easy thing to be against the other, obviously. Even bringing in people 
that have uh, differences of opinion, that's like really important for us, right? That we're you know, being challenged on our own ideas, but that scales, I think, at, at least trying to understand what's happening and they're trying to educate yourself on what's happening in the rest of the world. Because the easiest thing, I think, is to be like xenophobic and to otherize people. And that is that creates an acceptance for what that tiny group of people does. So I think there is some hope here. I think there's some reason for optimism. I think xenophobia is... Um, is less powerful, actually, in American culture. Why do I know this? Why do I think this? Because my son plays chess on his phone with kids, I'm not kidding, in Syria. <laughs> he does. He plays chess w with kids he won't meet, probably, uh, who are all over the world in countries he hadn't heard of before. So, you know, I think that actually makes it less likely for people like him to press the button to send the bombs to a place like Syria, if you know someone there. There's more actual interconnection among peoples all over the planet because of what we have in terms of technology. And that's a real cause for hope. Well, first of all, that's why we have a podcast. That's why we're doing this. 20 years ago, it would just be the three of us talking on the street corner, and no one would know about it, right? right? So there's real reason for hope, which gives me further motivation to do what I do. Uh, well, like Brett, Thad, you guys have been awesome. And I just want to say thank you very much to Heidi and Camille for being here. This was very rich and layered and informative and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Can I see those hands again? Let's take Norm. Completely different topic here, uh, but something I've, I've been wanting to ask about. This has been a terrific event. I want to echo Jason's comments. And um, it, it's terrific to have these forums. It's terrific to have podcasts. A lot of it is because people are craving, and a lot of these books and such, craving another voice, craving another point of view, another perspective on things. It was a little while ago, not too long ago, that I was a student at a university Get, and in particular in the humanities and social sciences, being given particular points of view on history, being taught particular facts, etc. We brought up the discussion on working outside the system versus working within the system. And I personally encountered situations where speakers that didn't conform to a particular point of view on university campuses, even just trying to bring them in, was very difficult. How exactly do you work yourself into that dynamic to people who aren't already trying to seek out that alternative point of view and that alternative perspective on various things, in particular in the humanities and social sciences? What do you mean? Can you rephrase the question at the end? How do you work into it? Or so, so, or maybe specify a little bit, so like a, maybe with an example. Ra you rather had. than rather than necessarily what is the mainstream point of view on history, we'll take history as an example. How do you, to those who aren't necessarily seeking it out, how do you introduce them to other facts and other oh. or, or opposing ideas or, oppo or opposing ideas? Okay. In particular, when when they're already when they're just in these conventional forms and such, how, how do you how do you bring that about? Uh, well, I can just start from my own experience, and maybe this will give you an idea. Ironically, when I was uh, a new libertarian, I had a real problem with consent, like as far as accessing or interfering with other people's minds. I knew a lot of shit, and it was real important that I told them about it on my terms. And I, you know, I've told the story before on my podcast, like family members, you know, it's, 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 there's this tribal thing too, where, um, my webmaster said to me once in like 2009, he goes, you know, if you put like all the emotional energy you put into trying to change the minds of eight people, if you just kind of redirected that into the thousands of people out there, that would probably be time better spent. But it was like real important to me to convince the people who are close to me that I was right. And I was very belligerent and I was very disrespectful and I didn't care about their readiness or their willingness 
to hear these things. So there were probably a lot of times like in the last 10 years where I had information, whether it was about, you know, something that was ha- like cryptocurrency, like, oh, hey, you guys might want to, you know, take a thousand dollars and route it here. You know, no one would have listened if I had health. I had health information for a family member, very, very left wing family member who's struggling with a lot of things. I could not have gotten him to listen to me because I had burned those bridges, wasted time talking about politics. Right. I didn't care that people weren't ready to hear what I had. So the ultimate the consequence was I would watch my own family. I'd come into the room and they would change the subject like as covertly and as subtly as they could. So they wouldn't have to listen to what I had to say about certain topics, political, historical, um, you know, philosophical, ac- economic, e- education, especially. Holy shit. They didn't want to hear that because I didn't care whether or not they were ready. I had things that I wanted to say. That's an important thing to really be conscious of, right? Is that some people are just not going to be ready for that. And maybe you have to take a subtle, softer approach. Um, or you have to be able to communicate some kind of value for them in introducing whatever you want to introduce. I think I know how to do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> you have to... People love drama. They love stories, and they love drama. And they actually love conflict, don't they? Right? That's what movies are all about, conflict between people. Sometimes about ideas, but usually about conflict, for sure, right? And when I was teaching in the normie colleges, as a normie professor, that's what I would do. Because there was, of course you know, near unanimity among the students on all sorts of issues. And the conservatives and the libertarians, if they existed, didn't speak. So I had to create a debate. And so what I would do, I would present some classic debate, you name it, between Plato and Thrasymachus on the, on the existence of a universal morality. They had this debate in the beginning of Republic. It's a classic debate. And, you know, almost all the students would be on one side or the other, but I would force them to take sides and I would actually write their names on the board there would be a Plato team and a Thrasymachus team and then you know everybody would be on the Plato team maybe and then so I would challenge them until I would get some defectors from the Plato team who would come over to Thrasymachus's side and once their name is attached to an idea or a set of ideas or an argument right the ego becomes involved And then the drama starts, and then it's super interesting because they're also competitive and want to win. And that's what intellectual debate has always been to me. When I entered college when I was 18 years old, I was expecting that's what it would be all the time, would be just great philosophers sitting in a room arguing with each each other about big ideas. Of course, it's not what it is. So I had to create those debates in in that setting, and that's how I did it, and it worked. It is dramatic. It is entertaining. It's actually, I think, the best show in town. The contest of ideas. When I watch TV and I come across some real debate, not stupid people on Fox or MSNBC shouting at each other, but real debate every once in a while, it does appear in American culture, believe it or not. I stop and I love it, right? Watch freaking William F. Buckley's firing line from the 1960s and 70s. It's high drama, as a matter of fact, with fascinating characters who may hate each other's guts, but certainly hate each other's ideas. Going at it, no holds barred, basically no rules. Uh, it's just that most Americans, as I said, aren't interested in ideas in the first place, so they can't, they suck when it comes to debating, but some are good and those who are good, we just need to put on stage more often and people will see, I think that it's a drama and they will come. I really do. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in my own podcast. I've seen it happen in my classroom. So you're fascinated by it, right? Norm, you find that Uh, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, Eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So seek out the the people who are good at doing that, and not a, very few people are good at doing it, right? Uh, but those who are good at it, who are good, you know, debaters, or just I'm not debaters, who are principled intellectuals, who are actually curious and open, and won't resort to ad hominem attacks or cheap shots. But that very few people are good at that. But there are some. Find them, celebrate them, put them on stage, listen to them, and then recommend them to your friends. Like, you know, this podcast, for instance. But, I think uh, yeah. both of our answers, though, neglected one important part for you. What's your motivation for doing it? Um, what do you get out of it? Well, th- that's the thing is, but, you know, I was I studied economics and finance, but I was a minor in political science. And um, 
I encountered it personally when I was in college and a particular college, I was politically active and I tried to encourage actually debates between a socialist group on campus and us. And we were just shut down. We were just explicitly shut down by the university faculty. They weren't interested in even having what, what kind of justifications were you given? If any, it, well, it's actually kind of funny. Um, hearkening back to it in their own code, there would be, on one hand, they would say that they were an arena for ideas, that they were advocates of free speech. But on the other hand, anything that was regarded as offensive or, or made people uncomfortable, that there was not any room for it on the campus. Oh, yeah. And so the problem is that people like that tend to run college campuses these days, right? Yeah. So they won't even allow debate. Of yeah. Any kind, right. So the thing we need to do then is leave those colleges and form our own. And I mean that. And I don't mean necessarily something like Renegade University. I mean things like podcasts and discussions in other fora. We can do it. They exist now, right? There's another public square. There are many public squares. Just leave. Let them have their college. Let them have their college and let them have their monastery really is what it is and go make our own place where we talk about ideas. That's what we're doing. Fair enough. enough. Well, thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, Norm. There are a lot of bright spots with that, too. I think people have this idea that all of the social sciences are like you can't debate. Debate is a tool of the patriarchy used to invalidate your feelings. That's not like the majority. Like I have friends who are professors at Dartmouth, like in the history, the political science department. And they're, and I'm sure you've encountered people like that, too. And there's people who probably share some of that feeling here that they're super frustrated with that. Yeah, you know, they, they don't like that there is no forum for that. But they probably censor themselves constantly. I, yeah, oh, absolutely. Which is the real absolutely. problem. Absolutely. The, absolutely. the SJW threat is grossly exaggerated. There are a handful of them on each campus, but there's like 10 or fewer in my experience. Mm-hmm. So they're not, I, that doesn't matter. The problem for me is that the faculty in particular censor themselves and won't allow themselves not just – they stop themselves not just from having a debate. They stop themselves – sorry, they, they don't – just stop themselves from saying the, the politically incorrect things they think, they also stop themselves from debate. If you're an academic, if you've ever been a professor or even a graduate student, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It actually ends up, the, there's a sort of code of civility within academia that makes me crazy. It ends up basically being anti-intellectual. Real, a real contest of ideas, you know, is, can be fierce and your ego is going to get involved and emotions can be involved. And it actually is avoided in my experience among academics. They don't actually like to fight in any way, at least in public. They do a whole bunch of nasty stuff to each other in academic journals and behind their backs and in book reviews, but face to face in a place like this, they don't do it. The kinds of debates we had this weekend where we had a socialist professor arguing with a lot of libertarians and some, you know, certainly anti-socialists. I mean, I don't think I've, ever, no, I've never seen that in a, in a, in a college, really. Not, certainly not at the level you all had. And I wasn't even involved in those debates, by the way. This was just you guys. I don't think in my 20 plus years at elite universities in the United States, I ever saw debates like those. I know, because you all are very smart and you're here because of one, for one reason only, ideas. You're interested in ideas, right? That's why you're here. My students, on the other hand, at Columbia and Barnard, the new school in Occidental and blah, 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 they didn't even know I existed until they were forced to take my class, essentially. And then, you know, then they got into my class and then maybe they found out that, you know, I was cool or whatever. But basically, it was coerced, right? They weren't there because of me or because of ideas. They were there to get a credential and they just happened to be in my class, right? take my class or somebody else's class who valued ideas as well. This is where it's at. This is where spaces like this is where people come solely to talk about ideas. And this is, this is not the only space. So there's a lot of reason for optimism. Absolutely. Hands again. Joel. Hey, Joel. Good to be here. Good. (laughs) You, you're scaring me. (laughs) <laughs> really you look like you have something dangerous to say or are no you, oh, okay never danger well then i don't want to hear from you 
so integrity is one concept I want to get to. I want to preface that by recognizing that in our culture, I think it's safe to say that there's this dichotomy between altruism and selfishness. And oftentimes altruism is emphasized as good and selfishness is bad. I think both you and Brett agree that that's false and that there's health, there's healthiness in selfishness. Just to be clear, I don't say it's false. I just don't prefer it. Sure. Sure. That's all. Um, now I think you have two different takes and one, so you have your, Thad, you have your politics of self-interest. And then I think Brett takes more of a perhaps Randian or Nathaniel Brandon inspired approach, which is a uh, enlightened self-interest or intelligent selfishness. And, um, I think I just wanted to see if we can clarify that. And so integrity, which is, which is the last of Nathaniel Brandon's six pillars of self-esteem, which you, the two of you discussed in your last conversation. I, I sense when you guys were talking about that, that that was sort of a, you didn't feel so com comfortable about, about that word, that that was some sort of moralism in there. So your politics of self-interest, correct, is, is absent of moralization. I try. Yeah. yeah. I'm not perfect, but that's what I try. That's what I strive for. I strive to remove <laughs> morality from my own calculations. Right. About what to do in my life. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So integrity, do you attach mor morality to that word? It was you I had that discussion with. I remember this discussion with somebody. Was it integrity about with you? Was that Yeah, personal yeah, integrity. And I rejected the notion, about. basically, right? Or I, I was at least skeptical of the notion i felt like after we talked about it a while you bought into it a little bit when i when no i, I think i'm against it <laughs> i think i'm against integrity this uh, this day i felt like as i explained it you know as it being the oh. final of the six pillars of self-esteem which is basically nathaniel brandon's i i know that is such a loaded term but that positive self-regard through these actions through living consciously was the first one. Yeah, okay. Accepting yourself, taking responsibility, being assertive, yes. being purposeful, and then living so with integrity. So that's a very particular definition of integrity, which is fine. Okay. That's not, of course, the, the common definition of integrity. I think the way at least Americans think about it and talk about integrity is about being true to what or who you were before this moment. Right? But almost everyone would agree that that's bad. Because, uh, no, what what Americans will uh, punish you for severely is if you contradict now what you said or did a minute ago or a year ago or 10 years ago. Americans uh, love to punish. People OK, I think the time is important and they call that a lack of integrity. Right. OK, so like the John Kerry, uh, the thing that Bush got Kerry with in 2004 was yeah. like the best. I was before it before or, I was against it. That or was on, Hillary yeah. or Hillary Clinton being against gay marriage one minute. Barack Obama. Gay right. Marriage the next. And or, you know, it could be small things, too. You know, I mean, people you'll get teased. Right. My son, so I think about my son all the time. He was like, you know, one minute he knows for sure he doesn't like some food. And then five minutes later, I noticed that he's eating a lot of the thing he just said, said he didn't like. And I tease him for it. And I probably shouldn't. But I think what Americans sort of would put that generally under the category of lack of integrity. I think, right? It's about identity, who you are, and what you believe, and they're basically demanding that you stay the same. I think it's a fundamentally conservative, actually reactionary, and if you don't reactionary concept. Does that make sense, though? Do you, well, do you think that Americans think that way? Yeah, I think that's the general. Okay, then I'm definitely uh, against connotation. That. Yeah, yeah. So I think we can evolve that connotation. So that there's not a morality attached to it, mm. and it's in line with the politics of self-interest. Okay. So I can talk about this, but in my own life, I'm, this is one thing I'm really thinking about. How can I align my values and actions? And what's I think, and I want to clarify this for myself, which is why I'm up here, but what's motivating me to do that is self-interest, is almost a, a bodily pleasure that would, uh, I, I would experience throughout my days, if my actions and values were aligned more frequently. Give me an example. I, li I like this, though. I like bodily <laughs> okay. pleasure attached to ideas. Keep going. Sure. Okay, so I'll just tell my quick story, which is, okay, so I've listened to Brett for nine years, 
started listening to Brett when I was student teaching. And I've been essentially working in schools for the last eight years. So I, I earn my salary through taxation. And I don't like that. You're a public because, school teacher. Uh, it's charter. Yeah. It's a charter school. Mm -hmm. But it's still government funding. So I, with my values, I value voluntary interaction. I value harmonious relationships. And because the funding that pays my salary isn't achieved through that, I'm not meeting my need for integrity. And thus, I'm seeking to evolve so I can, I can line those actions and values. And I think that would create a better life. And that, that's in my self-interest. It's not out of morality. I think it is, though. I'm sorry to say. Even though, you know, I'm with you on what public schools are and what even taxation is, that's, that's a moral claim. You, you're, you feel bad about it because you think it's wrong to do that to other people. You think other people are being harmed, right? Right. Uh, but so we're using speaking, the word so bad. So then you're speaking on behalf of other people, which by definition is a moral claim. Well, it, it's, it's, I feel sad or I feel regret or uncomfortable because I think I'm harming someone else. Yeah, but you do know, first of all, Joel, right, that most people don't think they're harmed by this. Yeah. So you disagree with them about their own lives and their own experience and whether or not they're harmed. I'm with you on the politics. I'm just saying most Americans are not, right? So you're actually making a moral claim on their behalf, aren't you? But you're, uh, you're, I think you're kind of taking that away from him. Like you're saying that integrity is a useful concept because it sends a signal to you about something that is producing discomfort or dis-ease in you, Yeah. right? And it's something it, that you want to evolve me. and grow beyond. You want to do something differently with your life, and this is a tool – for recognizing that. So I don't see how I mean, that's I'm open not to being wrong because if I'm just perceiving it where I just I'm just I'm just internalizing these morals and that's why I have discomfort right. and I want to know about it. Right. And then I can I don't think it's about feeling bad or feeling guilty which is attached to morality. Okay. Right? I think it's about fundamental human needs which is I, I want to respect other people. That's a need for me. It's a selfish need for me to have harmonious relationships. So when I'm when that's not happening then I'm I'm failing to Meet my own needs, my own yeah. I, I, enjoyment. I think, I think, it's, I think the, the primary concern you have is, <clears> though, for other people and their, their interests. You feel like their interests are being infringed upon, so you're actually making a decision about what their interests are for them. And in fact, we know, right, that in most cases you disagree with them about what their interests are because most Americans think that they should be taxed for the schools. Yeah, but that's... I, I hear what you're saying, but they think they're I, being they think they're being helped by being taxed to pay for the public schools. Yeah, yeah, but you're, you're, you're appealing to popularity, right? Most I mean, Americans believe that. What is that, though? That's Joel. I'm sorry. No, but, I'm not. I mean, okay, let, let's say that. Let's say there's one person who doesn't believe that, and they're getting taxed to pay my salary. That's all I need. Like, well, then yeah. if they came to you and asked you you know, to stop teaching, that would be one thing, right? So here's a way. Here's, I'm not doing it for them, though. So I think I might have a way out for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see if this will work. So, um, so, man, I feel you. I know what it is. I have internalized all these things, too, because I'm an American. I was born here, even though I have all these critiques of it. Uh, I've said before that I feel bad at the end of a day. Well, I pretty much every day I feel bad at the end of the day for not having done enough work. Mr. Right. Mr. Critic of the Puritan work ethic. That is clear. I mean, even after I've spent sometimes 12 or 16 hours working straight, right, I still feel bad. That doesn't make any sense, except that it must be my inner Cotton Mather talking. It's got to be inside of me. It's a moral thing that's making me feel bad at the end of the day. There's no other way to explain that. Did you so, say anything about feeling so, bad or no, wanting I, to grow? I don't... I, it's more about wanting to experience more pleasure because I, I, I've, I, when, earlier in my career, I felt more of that guilt or I felt bad. And it was more about my, my, my morality. Yeah. But as I've evolved in my thinking, philosophy, and, look, and, and trying to look at this through the lens of, of, of self-interest strictly, mm -hmm. I, when, I, when I, I, mean, I analyze it and I... I, I, I don't know. I just I know I walk into the building almost every day and I feel a bodily discomfort and I right. want to assuage that. Yeah, because you're a hypocrite, right? Because you believe there should be no public schooling. 
and you work for a public school. So is hypocrisy that, is automatically right, tied to morality? Is that right? That you're a hypocrite in that way? Right. Yeah. Right. So um, here's, here's how you can get out of it. First of all, I want to ask you why you still teach then, right? <laughs> but, but so here's the thing. Do you want to live in a society in which there is no public education? Right? Right. You do, don't you? Right. Okay. So then you are simply working against your own interests by teaching in a public school. Well, uh, yeah, that's, well, that's not good, but that's the extent of it, right? In other words, if you want $5 and you give away a dollar, you're working against your own interests. But you're skipping across the surface too much. You are. No, because, because, but, but no, no because you're I'm just not. saying, no, because you know, you're saying for 40 hours a week, you do this. So you are working against your self-interest. That's skipping across the no, surface. His, his self-interest, he told me, is to live in a society in which there is no public schooling. It's a part of it. So by obviously for working for a public school, you're contributing to the very thing you want to see abolished. It'd be like an abolitionist maybe owning a slave, right? Right. Okay. okay. So you right. So you're simply working against your own interest in that way. Now, it, here's the good news. It's a relatively minor way, right? The, the, the future of public schooling in America is not probably going to be determined by whether or not Joel continues to teach in a public school, but you are contributing in a way to this thing that you think should not exist. And you would rather live in a world in which those institutions don't exist, and you're contributing to that. So you're working against your own interest. So stop. <laughs> But there's no reason to feel bad about it. Right. Yeah. Did you say you felt bad? I, I mean, don't know what bad means. I mean, I think it's too vague of a word. Well, you but said, well, how did you, you just, you, when you walk into that building, everybody, you said something. You said a word. I feel, um, dis something, wasn't it? Uncomfortable, uneasy. Those sound like feelings uh, to me. Those yeah. sound like bad feelings. Yeah, un undesirable feelings. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to strip the morality out of it by, by not using the word bad. Yeah, and I'm but, telling you, here's how you do it. Stop feeling bad. You don't need to feel, there's no reason <laughs> to feel bad except like, if you want, again, it's the same thing, right? If you want, I don't know, if you have $1,000 and you want to keep the $1,000 and you give away a dollar, you're working against your own interest. It's the same thing. It's a very small way in which you're working against your own interest, but you are. So stop giving away the dollar. Stop teaching in the school. If it matters well, that's that the much plan, you. But, but otherwise, there's, why else feel bad about it? I don't know. This word bad is just... Why do you feel, it's what do you say, not uneasy? Specific enough. Why do you feel uneasy about it? You have a negative Be feeling when you walk in the doors of that building every morning, you said, right? Right. Negative, yeah. It's, so, it's an unwanted feeling. So why do you feel that feeling? Because I want to have voluntar voluntary relationships, and I'm contributing to involuntary relationships. You want to live in a world in which relationships are voluntary. Yeah, and I want to do that in my own personal life. Yeah. Right. You're working against your own interest by working there. But you're not hurting anybody else is my point, right? That's my point here. But that's not the totality uh, of his you're interest. Not, you're not necessarily hurting anyone else. And in fact, I can almost prove that you're not hurting anyone else because we've taken polls of Americans asking them what they think about public schools and whether they should be funded by tax dollars. And overwhelmingly, they have said for about 100 years, yes, it's good that they take money from me to pay for those things. So no one thinks you're hurting anyone else except you. Well, I know on principle that, that I'm hurting people. That, are you that, that the tax the tax man is hurting people? Is there a contradiction between your employment and your philosophy? Sure. Is there a contradiction between your employment, your means of living, and the society you want to live in? Yes. But that's just between you and you. You know what I mean? Why would you feel bad about it? Otherwise. I don't see any reason to feel bad about it, except in that way. Yeah, I, I guess I think you can you can eliminate bad or, or guilt by changing your values or by by rethinking it, like you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know if I can automatically erase these feelings just by rethinking it. Oh, it's I, not easy. Cotton Mather still lives inside of me every day, <laughs> and I've been shouting at him for decades. Let me say no, something I'm else. open to the fact that I can adjust my thinking to, 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 to um, avoid the, the, the un unwanted feelings more. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think my, if I want to be to self-actualize to a, a higher level of pure joy, right? Mm -hmm. If I can um, evolve my career to a, to a new place, which I'm working to do, mm -hmm. then I'm going to feel 
more like physiologically there's going to be more there's going to be more bliss and joy and excitement and that's that's what I'm that's my initial that's my initial point in all this is that the motivation is to enhance the quality of my life yeah, yeah you you like ideas yeah. too you like talking about ideas that's where you're here right yeah and this is a voluntary association we have this weekend isn't it where we all just voluntarily agreed to come here and join together and talk it is totally unlike your classrooms right because those kids are forced there it's compulsory school yeah i mean it, right? I, I do music and so it's a lot more voluntary but and, the kids but, are there for one reason. But they're reason in the only, actual building yeah. because of the compulsory they're nature. They're required by the state to be there, right? Right. Their parents literally would go to jail if they weren't in that school, right? Uh, so here's the thing, though. You like ideas. You like voluntary associations. You like things like this weekend, this meeting of people. You like ideas. Here's the really bad news, Joel. You live in America, and it's really hard to make a living if you're like you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and, that's and, why and, I don't really feel bad about it. And, I, here, like, and here, is a, here is one of the very, very few jobs in which you can do anything that's even a semblance of what we do here, which is teach school, unfortunately. So you chose, in a way, the right job or maybe the best possible job yeah. in the moment. Yeah, and it's not yeah. easy to just change careers now, is yeah. it? And make a living. So it's hard. So here's another reason to not feel bad. This is right. one of the, can we just do like the meta talk of this? Do you sure. feel like you're being pigeonholed in any way in this dialogue? <laughs> do you feel like something has gone? Now, I've said this to you he, that he like. You didn't say anything about that. You did. No, I know, I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> okay. But you also brought up the word bad. And I'm, this is one of those times where I don't know exactly what to do, but something doesn't <laughs> feel right about this. And I know I'll realize it when I'm editing it. So I just want to take a minute to ask Joel, I like, because I know Joel, right? So when I say you're skimming across the surface, I know all the work that, like, we talk every week. Oh, okay. And I know all the work See, that I don't he's know done Joel, so on, this is unfair. You know, <laughs> per personal growth. Okay. And, and, you know, wrestling with a lot of these things and having a better relationship with self. So I feel like this, and this format obviously doesn't lend itself to a real authentic exploration of Joel. Yeah, it does. Right? <laughs> That's what we're here for. In 15 minutes? Joel? Do I think I'm being pigeonholed? Yeah. Do you, or, or anything else? Do you feel like the, the, the line of questioning that, that came at you, like similar to how I felt in the first show where we talked about drinking, do you feel like something has gone wrong? Even if you don't know what it is, it's okay. Yeah. We'll I figure mean, it out yeah. later. My, my intuition to that, that question is the answer is yes. I, it's related to, again, the language. Mm -hmm. So like in the world of nonviolent communication, there's a saying that beyond beyond right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. Right. And so in, in, in NVC, the, the morality, which you appreciate, that the morality is stripped out. It's all about every human action is in pursuit of human needs. So I'm looking at integrity as a human need. Yeah, so there's the morality. It just crept in right there. I, I don't see how that's. I don't see how a need is, is moral. You said human, right? So that's that. I assume that means all eight million, eight billion people have that need. According to you, that's a moral. Well, that's uh, a moral claim. The choice to emphasize different needs is up to the individual. So that that I really value that. Okay. Some people design, You know, there's different needs. There's 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 needs for for sleep and sex and fun and play that some people value more than others. Right. Okay. Um, so there's, I think, you know, NVC set, does say that these are universal needs, but every individual gets to choose what, how they're going to work with that balance amongst these needs and okay. kind of emphasize them. I mean, okay, it's just, it's, it's at least universalistic language, right? This is, that's what that, it's called humanism also, right? Claims on behalf of all of humanity, all of, all human yeah. beings want this or need that or have this interest, right? So I don't do that, and we can talk about yeah, that. And, but that's and there's, the there's always here. debate about the word "need." Is it is it need or desire or value? Yeah. Um, so, right. So that to me is the problem I, here, and I think and I I strongly suspect you're suffering from <laughs> morality. It's possible there's there's a dose of that at least. Yeah. Because um, I see no other reason for you to feel bad. It's a part of it for all of us, right? And I think I would say that this is somebody who I know who is much further along with that than the, the average person struggling with morality or the, the cotton mather, the Puritan inside well, their course, head. Yeah. So it's difficult to have this conversation, I think, in this format on the level that it needs to Can be Can I ask had. you guys so, a question? I don't know about this. I know only a slight bit about this nonviolent communication thing. I've yeah. heard about it a little bit. 
Where does it come from? Who, who invented it as a concept? Who developed it? Uh, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. And who is he? I don't know. Who is he? He was a psychologist? Yeah, he was a yeah. psychologist. Yeah. Okay. So he, he worked for, for decades developing this vocabulary of, of emotional intelligence, feelings, and needs, and, and learning to recognize that feelings are a result of either met or unmet needs. Right. And so he, and he was a facilitator in resolving conflict right. all is, around the world. Okay. This, I'm just purely curious. Okay. okay. I don't know. I, so I've noticed that a lot of libertarians talk about it. No yeah. one else that I know does. And so I'm just, I'm really just curious, why is it that libertarians are interested in nonviolent communication as developed by Marshall Rosenberg? Because it helps facilitate authentic connection. Authentic? We come to conversations trying to meet personal needs, mm -hmm. right? Do you disagree with that? Like if you get into yeah. a discussion or an argument, you're trying to get something out of it. Well, ideally, but right. people often engage in all sorts of interactions that work against their own interest. Okay. Then they're trying to meet needs through bad strategies. Okay. That's what right. they would say. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure, sure. So yeah. this is about, because libertarians obviously have a huge communication problem, you know, the belligerents <laughs> that this was, oh. Oh, I think it was, why? I think it was your friend Wes who actually introduced this whole thing into the libertarian oh, world. Really? Yeah. Oh, but that's yeah. what it's about. It's yeah. about the, the psych, the uh, personality problems of libertarians. Well, right. So Wes, is you know, okay. well, I mean, Wes saw it as well, a way to use you know, Interesting. by more than just oh, so this is a right. Wes Bertrand school sucks thing. No, 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 uh, no, not not exclusively. No, okay. he's done a lot of work with this. But Wes was somebody who eight years ago was calling everybody who worked for the government an authoritarian sociopath. That's how he referred to them. Right. Right. So there was some kind of evolution in his language. But what he said, look, if you if we really want to be able to transport these ideas, we have to be able to communicate productively and compassionately okay. with other people. So we have to recognize that we have needs, that our needs for having these conversations yeah. might be perverse in some sense. Like we might just want to bully other people with what we know to feel more morally or intellectually superior. Yeah. That's something we should be aware of. If that's yeah. what we're doing, that might not be, that's not ever going to be productive and it's not ever going to make you feel more effective as a communicator or a thinker if you're just trying to bully people no with, question. Okay. No question. So there's more... understanding both your needs going into a conversation and the other person's needs in the conversation. And if those things are in conflict, mm -hmm. then maybe you just get to a point where, shit, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. Or this is not a productive use of my time or the other person. I'm wasting this other poor person's time as well. So it's just a way of trying to become more in touch with the meta talk of conversations. Because obviously yeah. these conversations are emotional. Do you feel emotions right now? I'm feeling pretty calm right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel emotions, you? Yeah, there's always emotions. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I heard, all that's great, but I heard other things embedded in this concept. Or you heard morality because of yeah, needs? Yeah, and, and I do know Wes, and I do know Wes's primary influence, or one of them, is Ayn Rand, and her philosophy was objectivism, which is a big, fat, moralistic philosophy. And that's, that's Wes's biggest Universalistic, humanistic critique of Rand. Mora oh, well. I, okay. Yeah, once he I, discovered I mean, NBC, he started... That was, that's one, not to speak for Wes, but I would think he would say that that's a main critique of Rand is that her use of morality. Hmm. As, okay. Yeah. But I know that, I know that, well, okay. I don't know. It's, it seems, it sounds at least in your telling of it, and I haven't read Rosenberg, so I don't know what he thinks, but it, your interpretation of this thing, I did hear what I sounded like moral claims embedded in there about human needs, right? That's, that's in that is definitionally a moral claim. It's something I want to think about. I mean, I don't, I don't think the need for water is a moral claim. It's universal human need. Yeah, right. Um, so, I had and to, so then you have to look at the other concepts like the need for efficacy, the need for competence, the need for meaning and purpose. Is the need for meaning and purpose universal? You know, if you go back to your uh, mind-body dichotomy, then... Yeah, you know. Do you know? It, do you know about cholera in Yemen? Right, right. That's it's from a lack of a good water supply. So the water has been deliberately cut off. The supply of water to Yemen has been deliberately cut okay. off by the Saudis and the United States because it is going to save the rest of humanity. So it's actually in the in the interests of humanity, according to the United States and Saudi Arabia, to cut off water actually to human beings. So it's not a human need. Apparently, it's not a universal human need. The authorities who are doing that are not seeking to get their water needs met. 
They're no, trying they're, to get up. They're, they're, no, they're, they believe that cutting off water to particular people or particular times serves the interests of, human, of humanity generally. So when those people words, die, it will be proven that, yes, it was a yeah. universal human need. Yeah, exactly. Water was. Right. Yeah. No. Uh, no. All right, okay. Well, sorry for using the word proof. There will be enough evidence yeah. for us to agree, <laughs> I think, that water was a need for those okay. people and probably universal. Like, it, so, it's bio human biology requires it to survive. So let me ask, Joel, do you want to get rid of morality from your calculations or not? Yeah. Oh, Okay. I think yeah, you and I, you know, to be honest, I feel unsure about is I, I, this is what I've been wondering about is integrity. Is is that word inherently tied up to morality? And I think it is in the way that Americans generally use the word, not the way that Brett or others use it, but in the way that Americans generally use it. Yes, I think so. And that's why I got a podcast because I'm trying to change it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the culture's programming of me is influencing this, is but I think the. In terms of like the definition of integrity, influences my perception of it. Okay. Uh, but why is being why is integrity a good in itself? That's what it sounds like. You think, right? You think that integrity in itself is good because I think it produces more happiness. That's an instrument. That's a means to another end. Happiness would be the end there. Okay. That's cool. I'm into that. That makes sense to me. But it sounds to me that integrity in itself to you is a good. No, that's my whole point. Is that oh. it is a means to an end that is. Happiness that is joy. Okay. Okay. So when that you, comes from alignment. Right. Right. So when you're consistent and not a hypocrite and you're actually. Right. When I'm true to myself job, and, yeah. is, and the maximum number of interactions, then. Yeah. But we violate our principles every second of every day, no matter whether we're libertarians or socialists or communists or anarchists or liberals or conservatives, right? Because you walk on streets that were paved by the city government. That's that's mm. quite. There's probably uh, a lot of debate about. That's like a whole separate issue. But I'm saying you're so you're violating your principles no matter what. If you just live, that's in out the of world. my sphere of control. Hmm? I can't control that. Well, you have limited control over your employment, don't you? Right. That's right. So that's different than the roads. Well, you, so I think integrity would be where you have a choice, right? You don't have a choice. I mean, it, unless you can build a helicopter or <laughs> swing from tree to tree. That's I appreciate that. That's I appreciate that. <laughs> But I mean, is was that at all I don't helpful, really, or was that just a yeah. total waste of your time? It, it, no, it was helpful you because sure? you're reinforcing the the part. I think there is a part of me, like I said, that from the cultural programming that does internalize the morality aspect of it, mm -hmm. and so you're reinforcing that. Okay, I can let go of that. Um, but what I'm also seeking to do is evolve to the next level of of joy and happiness. Okay, let me just say one last thing to hopefully make you feel even better. Okay. <laughs> You doing things like this and reading books and having these ideas and talking about them in public and in private with all these people, right, does a thousand times more to get you to the world you want to live in than leaving your job as a public school teacher would. Don't you think? Yeah. Leaving your job would do so little to advance your cause. But what yeah, you it's do more about what I do in the rest of your do. life does yeah. so much yeah. to get you there. So you are actually meeting your self-interest pretty damn well, I would say. Yeah, and that's why I'm really glad to be here. So we're good. Just, yeah. Stop feeling bad. <laughs> good. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, Joel. I mean, that's just objectively true, right, Joel? Oh, come on. <laughs> Show of hands again. Britt. You doing okay? Feeling all right? Yeah, yeah. All right, good. Mm. Good, I'm glad we got to you. Mm. Yeah. All right. This might not get that. This is, I don't want to turn this into a self help session. I do. Though it may have just become one. Uh, I have uh, three children. Well, do you want to talk about why Donald Trump is the first queer president or children? I'll talk about. Because I've never actually heard you answer. Trump, queers, whatever. I've never you want. heard you answer. I've heard you allude to Donald Trump as the first queer president. Yeah. But I've never actually heard you say why. Oh. But. I feel like my kid's a little more important than him. Um, okay. I have three children. I uh, have a 10-year-old, a 4-year-old, and a 5-month-old. Uh, my 10-year-old son, is. I have him with a woman who I am not involved with. And we are complete opposites. You and your son, or you it, and... And 
her. Her, okay. She is exactly what, and I sure hope she doesn't hear this, but I'm not mentioning anyone, so it doesn't matter. She is exactly what I think we all are here fighting against. Your eyes just got really wide, by <laughs> yes, the way? Yeah, yeah. Okay. which is what, that's a sign Okay, of what are we right? fighting against here? Well, uh, authoritarianism. Okay. Uh, just so you were with it, an authoritarian Jen, woman? I am, I and I oh, am oh, anti-authoritarian. Wait, are you currently with her? No, no, okay. no, no. You, I'm not you left the authoritarian. No, okay, no, good. no. Okay. I love my wife, okay. uh, who, is, who is a lot like me, so we, okay. we, we, it all jives. Um, but I have a child with a... Uh, mm. An authoritarian. I can't relate to that at all. Well, I don't you're know. You're going to have to go home that's now, what I, I don't even know what you're talking I about. I feel like you might. And if you <laughs> feel comfortable talking about this. Yeah. So how, um, I have these ideas, you know, and these ideas are very important to me. And I think about them all day. And I can't help but convey them to my children. Mm -hmm. And I have one child who's getting two very different perspectives on the world. Mm-hmm. Is it more, and I don't know if you can answer this, is it more important to plant those seeds in him than uh, save him from any confusion? You know what I mean? Because he's being pulled in two totally different directions. Yeah. And I can't necessarily help it, you know? I don't mind being philosophically alienated from the people I work with. I mean, I work, I'm, believe it or not, I told them earlier, believe it or not, I'm a plumber. Imagine me walking on that job site. You know, uh, it, it's Do you a, dress in this ear sucker no, suit when you're okay? No, then it's no, fine. Okay. No, no, no. But apparently, uh, overalls are, are controversial too. You know, hmm. but um, you know, I down don't, here. Oh yeah, I don't mind. Well, amongst the plumbers, I don't mind alienating myself from them. I don't mind alienating myself. I didn't mind alienating myself from my schooling. You know, I didn't mind that. But when it comes to your child. Mm -hmm. It's a different ball game. Okay. You know. Are you alienated from him? Well, I feel him being pulled stronger in the other direction. Yeah, I was, which okay. it and, and and you know, most of the world has that. Well, okay. Ha, so, has, ha, so so it's not just his mother. It's the world pulling him as well. Right. So there's the question of whether your son becomes the liberal democratic conservative republican right politically his ideas right which are different than yours that's one thing sure and then there's another question which i think is probably more important to you and it mm -hmm. certainly is to me which is his relationship with you and right whether you're alienated personally is it right. possible for you to have a good relationship the kind of relationship you want with your son if he has different political ideas right 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 than yours yeah i would have to say yes right, right. that's been proven many times in other relationships between I fathers and sons it can happen and I feel like, but it's at a very young age. Yeah. I feel like it, that, yeah. that that right. He's too that young so, to have political ideas anyway. Well, can you really? can you? But, but uh, when he's told, uh, you know, I, I don't give a shit about school. I don't care. It's not even on my radar. You know, when he came out of the womb, he was put in a Harvard onesie. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm dealing. He has yeah. a resume already. Okay. He's okay. ten. He hmm. does not like the freedom he has with me. Hmm. Do whatever you want. I, he, do whatever he wants. Yeah. He has called his mother, like I, you know, to ask what he should be doing at that moment. You know, and so it's caused this. Does he feel unsafe and insecure when he's with you? Maybe he does. So that would be the problem, right? And I don't know. I don't know, right? But that would be the problem, right? If he's if he's just trying to figure out whether he's a collectivist or an individualist. Right, right. You know, well, he's not age, thinking on those terms. 10, exactly. He's right. not thinking on those so terms. It seems so it seems to me that's all premature and no sure. reason to worry about anyway. So just wait. Because kids should, don't you want him to have his own ideas anyway? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, so then there's no problem there. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, what I do, I don't know, for whatever it's worth, I just tell my son constantly, this is my idea, what I'm about to say mm -hmm. or what I just said is my idea. It's controversial. Other people disagree with me. You can go whatever way you want with it. Now, of course... You know, it's a load. The dice are loaded because I'm his dad, and so right. and he wants to emulate me in various ways or reject me. So whatever I think will have some bearing on how he thinks. Sure, but I, I certainly try not to indoctrinate mm -hmm. in any way. It's inevitable, but I try not to. Well, I don't think but I. What's, yeah. I don't give a shit what his ideas are. I give. I all I care about is our relationship. I feel like someone else is indoctrinating though. 
and I'm not. Yeah. You well, know, and then that that's where the conflict comes. And what's I, your communication like with the mother? Because, I mean, I think that's really important. It's, if it's just cut off and there's uh, no dialogue about what's best for him well, or trying to be on the same page you know, in certain uh, ways. Homegirl likes to, uh, and has said this, uh, only communicate in a like we're running a business when it comes to our child. Yeah, I like. And I actually like you that. Do, see, I don't yeah, like that's it. my Well, that just goes against every. I guess I understand uh, the logistics of wait it. Wait a second. Wait a second. Aren't you libertarian-ish? Ish. Yeah, yeah. So aren't you for transactional relationships? Yeah, sure. So this you should love this. Well, and, and believe me, with X Y, but you I'm also love emotional. <laughs> I'm also emotional. Me too. Everyone I'm highly that. emotional. That's exactly why I want a purely transactional relationship <laughs> with a woman who triggers the shit out of me. Sure. I, well, mm. No? It would make life easier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but don't you want an easier life? <laughs> but it's not harmonious. Well, I guess it is harmonious. I, I can't decide yeah. if it's harmonious or not. I think, I mean, maybe you want to ask yourself how attached you are to what your son becomes politically and intellectually. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know well, if I just don't like on. seeing him submit. Okay. You know, well, again, he allows himself to be controlled. But even that's, isn't it up to him? Sure, it is. That's one I, way of living in I the world. But I still don't like it. I don't like it either, but that's his decision. You can yeah. be submissive as a person and you should be allowed to do that, right? That is actually suits some people. But I definitely see being... it being influenced. It's, it, it is being put on him. He's being controlled. Dude, and everything's being, being put, molded. Everything's that way. being put on him. He's a kid. That's all it is. The life of a child is a life of being coerced constantly, no matter what. Sure. Even in a you know pure anarchist utopia, because right. he's surrounded by adults who have more power and knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who are constantly constraining, regulating, coercing in all sorts of ways. Because we have to keep them alive, right? right. So we have to coerce them just on that level. Right. But it just happens. Dinner happens when we decide it happens, not when they decide sure. it happens. They can't cook. They can't feed themselves. They can't take it. We have to coerce them. They don't want to eat dinner sometimes. We have to make them eat dinner. It's nothing but coercion. It's a plantation. That's yeah. what the family is, I'm sorry to say. Okay, so, you know? That's a, that's a little absolutist, though, you want about be? the family, right? To say it's a plantation. If he's trying to build a family that's something different, and we're just saying, sorry, yeah. you have a family, it's a plantation. And I'm, I'm actually interested, like, is it inevitable? Yeah, I think. So a family is essentially it's, it's, a plantation. It's an authority. And there's no other way it can it, work. It is an authoritarian. It's a totalitarian institution, as a matter of fact. I, I think, of course. Well, I think, How could it not be? All right. Well, do you agree that there's parenting philosophies out there that are trying to change that? that of course, like we all agree that historically that's how it's worked. Yeah. But, you know, I traveled across the country and met with dozens of families who are exceptions to the essentialist claim about the family that you just made. But the parents, even in the wokest, hippest, <laughs> coolest, homeschooling... There's still an element of control. They still hold the monopoly on violence, right? They're still the state in that setting, aren't they? In the family. Theoretically, yes. Would they ever actually... do? Some of these people actually do it? I would say no. What happens when their kid runs into the traffic on the street? That's not violence. You're pulling your body... Away from where you want to go. Is that vi show of hands? Is that violence? You're you're kidding, right? What do you mean? If to to pull somebody if, out. If you to, wanted to go in that direction, and I physically pulled you in the, the opposite direction, what would you think? How about old that? is the child? No, you. If you okay. If I did that to you, uh, tell me more about the situation. <laughs> oh, do I'm, I have a three year old's brain, and am I stepping in front of a car? Because I would say no. Thank you. Right. You're I just, would say it's contextual. Just, I think you just proved my point. How? <laughs> uh, I, because the state the state knows what we need and you know what the three-year-old needs the parent knows what the three-year-old needs it's the same same relationship some three-year-olds need to it's be hit by cars fundamentally paternalistic relationship and you can't change that fundamental fact i don't think okay but you can't but you also can to say it. that the family is a plantation period there's way more to talk about there yeah you can talk about how much you whip them or whether you whip them no, i'm saying no, that, i'm serious i'm serious you can, you can whip them. You could shame them if you don't want to whip them. That's what we've chosen in our society, right? Our families tend now to shame children instead of hitting them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that less authoritarian? Is, it, is, that, is the fundamental relationship changed? No. We make them feel a different kind of pain. That's all. Am I wrong about that? 
do they get to choose when they come back home? No, even in your awesome schools. And I love them. I do. And I, God bless them for trying as hard as they can. I just think they're up against an inescapable fact. But there are kids who are, I mean, and there's a lot of debate about this is like age of consent. When, when does a child have the, or age of decision making, well, like let's one. not use a loaded term. Here's, when does a child prove through their action that they're responsible enough to be able to make these decisions? Yeah. Well, right? So that's, that's a different kind of calculus for We'll get back to you in a minute, Britt. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. No, I mean, and I do have a question for you about this. Well, let me, one last thing. Should children be able, can they decide to move to a different family? No. I tried it no. once. I tried it once. My ask, parents didn't let ask, me. Ask all of your people. All my of your, parents thought it was funny when I tried. The, all but, of the parents in your network, yeah. and I know some of them, and I do love them, ask them that. Do they let their kids choose which family they live in? Hell, no, come on. No, do we no, really? No. Come on. It's, right. it's a totalitarian institution. Okay, it's a plantation. But you've, uh, okay. No, 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 okay. no. You're right. Stop. I'm sorry. Enough. Actually, because you. I do take it back. I take it back. Okay. I take it back. All right. I take it back. It's a prison. It's not a plantation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you, if you have to go to an absurd example that almost never happens, I want to move to a different family. Who, who's Ryan, who, show of hands, who's Ryan, trying to move to a different right family? Right here, sitting in front of me, I, his, his eyes just caught mine. He was telling me on Friday night about, I won't get into specifics and I won't use your last name, but you described your family kind of in this way, didn't you, right? And I'm saying even when you're not homeschooled by an authoritarian, mm-hmm. even if you're in, as I said, the grooviest, hippiest family ever, it's still, at the end of the day, they're the state. They have a monopoly on power and violence and you don't get to choose to go to another family. You don't get to leave this country, dude. You live according to this. What if they hate free, what's it called? Free parenting? What are the uh, 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 Peaceful parenting. Peaceful parenting. What if they hate peaceful parenting? A lot of kids would, I bet. I bet. Oh, sure. I wish sometimes that I had had a football coach for a dad. Oh, yeah, because I had zero parenting. I wanted someone to tell me what to do. Okay, but that's, okay, first of all, that's an anecdote. And second, I think what's important is that you had to go to 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 stick to stick with the family as a plantation, mm-hmm. you had to go to what I think is an absurd example, right? So so again, the goalpost move. I don't know if if somebody says the family is a plantation and everyone is just supposed to go, oh yeah, I guess it kind of is. And then there's pushback, and you had to come up with a more absurd example. I want to hear what Britt has to say about and how I'm right. Can I just ask you one question about that? What was your intervention, or I, that's a strong? Uh, what was your dialogue with your son after he made a phone call? to his mother saying, what should I be doing now? How did you try to, you know, and after you answer that question, I actually have some very bad news. Um, well, I just asked him why. All I did was ask him why. Mm. And um, he didn't give me much other than, I just need her to tell me what she wants me to do. Yeah, I'm and sorry. I I'm, thought yeah. this, 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 you know, this might be a little too far gone and we moved on, you know. We just moved on. There wasn't much of a dialogue after that. And w- have you thought about a plan for the future, or is like has that happened again? Or uh, well, it's every it's a every day. It's a, I mean, it, it happens in in small minor ways, a lot often. Yeah. And um, I just really, it's like I, I I think I think where I'm where I'm getting uh, where I'm struggling is how important are these ideas? Mm-hmm. You know, how important do I think these ideas are? And, uh, yeah, I kind of do want to spread them to my children more than anything, more than, I don't really care sure. about anyone else. Of course. My children of course. are, it, it just brings a whole, you know, when they're of your loins, it's a different, of course, I get uh, it. I feel that too. It's a totally different thing. Sure. Well, I, I, I Spreading your ideas to them is something you obviously have way less control over yeah. than creating an environment in which they are receptive to ideas. Yeah. You know? And I think that that the latter is more important. You know, like my brother is a super authoritarian with his kids. It drives me crazy. And I'm like, and you know, there's I have problems with the way my other brother parents as well. And I want to say to them, they know I have a podcast where I talk to parents and, you know, I try to find the optimal ways to do these things for people like Take what you want, leave the rest behind. If this isn't for you, fine. But I'm trying to help as many people as I can with these kinds of questions about school and family and parents. And it's super frustrating that they absorb none of it, right? But what does he say to his child all the time when the child asks a question, a, why, a question that starts with why? He says, because I said so. Because I said so. And then, like, I, I said it to him one time. He was criticizing Obama, 
right? And people who vote for Obama and how stupid people are because they vote for Obama. Where do you think that worship for authority or that deference to authority comes from? Where do you think it starts? You know, it's not all because your parents says because I said so, but if that's like your introduction to authority, that because I am the authority, my the, the decrees that I hand down are unquestionable. Like, why do I need to do this? How fucking hard is it to say to a child, because I care about keeping you safe, and I'm worried that if you do this, this will happen. Or even a 30-second story about, well, you know, a lot of times when people climb these things, they, you know, they fall. Like, how hard is that? And I understand that I'm not a parent, and I understand that it can be exhausting, and I feel like I know a little bit about it, like from the, the, the frustrations and the challenges from the work that I used to do with some really challenging kids, but it's still not the same, and I get that. But... Yeah, that kind of authoritarian parenting that you're dealing with, I really, my heart goes out to you because I really want to continue this conversation with you yeah, sure. um, privately if you want, because I think this is really important. And I, I don't know what I can say that just isn't going to be like, disc- oh, he has Can I just that. say one last, <laughs> yeah. last, last thing, I promise? Yeah. So my relationship with my father was entirely intellectual. That's how we related to one another through talk of ideas and politics and history. So it was just endless discussions about this battle in the Civil War and that battle in World War II and the Democratic Party platform. It was pure intellectualism. That was how we communicated with each other. It was starved, right? There was no emotional content to it. So when I said something that he didn't like politically, we had a bad relationship. When I said something he liked, we had a better relationship. But it certainly did not give me what I wanted as a son, and it certainly wouldn't as a parent either. So you... This is up to you. That's what my dad could handle. That's what he had to do. But you have a choice about what you value. Do you value that kind of a relationship or do you value that plus something that's different that's maybe more emotional? And right. And so Well, I well, I, I do value an emotional relationship over I over mean, most uh, things, well, but I feel like he's he's naturally opposed to that. He's becoming opposed to an emotional relationship. Oh. That's that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. You know? I I <laughs> so the the problem is here's the problem he actually there is a market in his life uh-huh. this this is what fucking sucks for us man he can actually choose one of you over the other yeah yeah right yeah. in one way or another it's horrifying right that's the problem with divorce and, yes. it's, and it's especially hard usually for dads yeah they sure. always have that power over us and right. i'm always terrified of him exerting that power right Basically, just letting me know maybe that he would rather be at mom's house kills me. Yeah, it's awful. Right? He doesn't have to actually go there. Just he could just let me know in any way. And he knows that will eviscerate me emotionally. So there's nothing you can do about that. (laughs) I don't think. I think that's also just an inescapable fact. But I don't care what he thinks about politics, really. I don't know. But that's up to you. Well, it's 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 not about... Yeah. A no, politics I know, I know. is authoritarianism. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. submissive. Sure. So here's what's happening. We're getting kicked out of here at 7 o'clock. Okay. That was just... Okay. AJ just told me. Okay. I don't know all the details yet, but we got to shut this mic off and get everything we is have it, out of this place. Is it 7 now? 6.57. Okay. So... Okay, well, let's discuss this. The podcast had kind of an unfortunate and abrupt end. Yeah. I was sorry to... That happened, but uh, I was also happy that I did get to, or we got to speak with several people before that happened. But yeah, we uh, unfortunately ran up against a hard stop with the owner of the venue and had to vacate the premises. But uh, we did continue lots of conversations afterward for many, many hours, way into the night that night, which was fantastic. But they weren't on the mic, although I think for some people that was it was good that it wasn't on the mic. Um, Nonetheless, there were several people who did want to be on the podcast who weren't able to. So I am very sorry about that. And we talked about the possibility of maybe doing like joint interviews with some of them through Skype in the near future, like maybe over the course of the next month, because there were some people that I definitely wanted to hear from. I wanted to hear their stories. I wanted to hear their questions. So I think that that's realistic that we could at least get a couple of those in. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's true every time, but the crowd was great. The after hours socializing and conversations were great. And I'm looking forward to the next one. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredlisteners.com. To purchase any of the Renegade University video courses, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses.